All right, so welcome to the Electron Injection Podcast. I'm Brandon Drury, your host. What the hell's a host? Isn't a host somebody invites you over? Maybe a guy runs a game show. Anyway, uh, I'm the guy. This is my podcast. I'm doing it. Um, we're gonna be we're going to be all over the place today. The main topic is: Does Arduino programming have any place in the professional environment? I'll probably have to knock it down for the title. But uh, do pro products have any business with with Arduino in them? And uh, I, you can guess what I say if you follow me at all. You can guess what I say. It's yes, but it depends, of course, as all engineering uh, answers require. It depends. But I, I want to kind of get off topic and just talk about. Uh, a handful of things on my list here today. Oh, wait, you're not supposed to see my list. I'm supposed to be big and beautiful. <laughs> there I am, big and <laughs> Okay, anyway. Um, I'm thinking of all the modern politics. Have you seen commercials where they show very large people with cellulite and yuck? And um, let's put it this way. Like, I'm no Fabio. I shouldn't be on the cover of any of those ro romance novels. Fine. Well... Don't put me on that. <laughs> That's my point. <laughs> it's okay to be special and on TV at the same time. You're superhumanly fit and muscular and all that stuff, but you knock yourself. I don't know. <sighs> I'm not going to be buying Dove soap or panties or whatever. So. Anyway, so the first thing I want to talk about is the power of wool socks. And again, this I know this is a maker, electronics y programming type of, of podcast, and it is, but I just want to make sure everyone knows. That if the crap hits the fan and it gets bonkers cold, wool socks are incredible. And I have heard that there is better stuff now with all their neoprene. Uh, what's the stuff that you can get shot? Yeah, you know, they put in the gun, Kevlar. They, God knows what they're putting in these, these new socks. But I found a stash of wool socks that I didn't know I had. And uh, when the temperature hit zero degrees this past week and we had a huge snowstorm, you know, basically a foot of snow. Uh, the wool socks were an absolute savior. I've had cold feet my whole damn life, and so highly recommended. So just that, that's just Brandon's tip of the day. You know, you do, uh, do with that what you will. Now, kind of a little bit more in the maker-engineered space, um, I can't stand wasting heat. And even like, right, I'm just anything, efficiency is my favorite thing. I love efficiency. I just don't like wasting anything. It's uh, part of the way I was raised, I guess. It's in me, and it's not going away. And so, like our house right now, I'm in one little corner of the basement of this whole house, you know. I don't want to have to the heat the whole damn house. And uh, just for me down here, if I'm the only one here, it doesn't make much sense. And, but with that said, you know, using a little electric space heater, these so damn things are so inefficient. And, you know, we learned that in thermodynamics, how the reasoning, or maybe it was uh, uh, my, my semiconductor physics class. Either way, we, we learned why, I can't remember why, but we learned why uh, electron, electronics don't like to turn into heat. I mean, they do, they turn into heat, but they're not near as efficient as other ways, like burning fuel and, and I don't know, I'm probably not saying that correctly. But anyway, um, so I don't like running the space heater either because I know I'm paying way more. I could probably heat the whole damn house for the price I pay for the space heater. So I, I don't like wasting energy and I don't like wasting money either. They kind of go hand in hand. So um, I've kind of come up with this new thing. Uh, this is the wife's idea. And she's all into these heating pads. She likes to just lay with one and sit on one and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't need that. But when it hit zero the other day, I was like, it's cold in here. It's cold. And I was keeping the, the thermostat in the house at 64. Uh, just be, Normally, we're at 66. But I, I, if we were human, if, if money was, was free, energy was free, uh, I would keep it at like 90. I, I love it hot. So I can't stand 66 even. But uh, we've been knocking the temperature down because we were... Um, I just didn't want to suck up too much energy. One, because the damn uh, thermostat would be running 24-7 probably when it was down to zero and the wind, you know, wind's blowing 30 miles an hour. So I didn't want that, but um, it, I really, uh, I just don't want to, I didn't want to put strain on the grid. Like I knew everyone on earth was was running their, their thermostat too. And in my mind, if ever, we all kind of just decided to, to back off a little bit and suffer a little bit, then maybe we won't blow up our grid the way that, you know, Texas had their problems. Now, I'm not going to blame Texas people. It wasn't like Texas thermostats necessarily caused that. I'm not really blaming that per se. I'm just saying that I wanted to put less stress on the grid. That was my whole thought process. So, so I sat on one of these heating pads. And when I sat on this heating pad, I was like, oh, I feel warmer. 
Because that's the thing, an issue since I've been doing these podcasts. If I get cold, I get kind of shaky and my brain shuts off and I feel stupid. I sound stupid. I mean, it, it's not good. And so what I'm doing right now, I have the, the thermostat at 64. My hands are kind of cold. It's, it's a, they're a little numb. My hands go numb very quick. As I said, I like 90. I like, I like it hot. But right now I'm sitting on this, this heating pad and uh, it's almost burning my butt. Almost. Uh, it's, it's, it's close. And so um, I, it, it solves the problem of some of that heat is, is traveling up into my body. So if you want to save energy, if you really want to be green, see all the people that talk about being green, I, I don't know how many people actually do it. Like I rode my bike to school for four years, Buster. I know what it's like to be green. And it's also red from, from uh, what is it? Frostbite and numb and it's not fun. But this is one way to save tons of energy. I don't know how much, how many watts we're pulling here. If I had to guess, it's like 15 or something. I don't, just a guess. Um, it, it seems like it's an extremely efficient way, kind of like riding your bike versus driving a car. When you think about the, the actual joules involved, there isn't a whole lot of uh, joules involved in burning your butt, but it will help. It helps a lot. So just consider that. Knock your thermostat down a hair, one or two degrees, and sit on a warm thing. Yeah, think about it. But anyway, it was a big deal for me. A fun little fact, and now this is gets into the making thing. Fun thing we did, we had about a foot of snow. I think it might have been eight inches, but it's hard to tell because the drifts make it three feet in some spots and two inches in others. But uh, we did the trick where you dump food coloring into the into the. Uh, do we do his food coloring? My my wife did this, so I'm kind of just stealing the like talking about the results. We we took balloons. We dumped water in them. Maybe she, yeah, she had to use food color. Had to. So uh, we put water inside the food color or inside the balloon with food coloring, tied them off. So we had a big water giant water balloon, as big as we can make them, you know, within reason. And uh, we we made four and we stuck them out in the snow. And the snow was uh, like I said, a foot deep. Uh, I actually wanted them out of the snow because it wanted the wind to cool them off quicker. So we put them outside, and you know, my, my son was like. 10 minutes later, he's like, are they done yet? And of course, he's eight. He doesn't, his idea of time is so, so screwed. And I was like, mm, the wife goes, the, the video said they've been done in four hours. And I was like, uh, I would give that 24 hours minimum. I mean, they were, you know, good size, like a, you know, like a cantaloupe, you know, some of them, some of them are smaller. But um, I said, yeah, why don't you give that 24 hours? So, after 24 hours, they're like, let's do it, let's, let's open them, let's see. And so I pulled them out, and one of them was already, like, one of them just busted instantly. Like, it was not solid at all. I, I couldn't, and it wasn't a very large one. I was kind of surprised. Like, I wondered if she put salt in it or something. Um, so anyway, uh, but the other uh, three survived, and they're up on my Twitter, Brandon underscore Drury. D R U R Y. Uh, you can check those out if you want. They, I, uh, they came out really cool. So, any of you people in cold weather who haven't already tried this or experiencing snow for the first time, or just next year, if you got kids especially, try it. Dump some food coloring um, and fill up a water balloon, tie it off, throw it outside. The kids loved it. You know, we called them dinosaur eggs. I thought that was kind of cool. But they, they look cool. They look kind of like a like a really expensive uh, bowling ball. That's probably not a good. They look like a fancy jewel. Whatever, check them out. So uh, on Twitter, I've I've been doing Twitter I, again. I kind of mentioned that already, but I actually like Twitter. I had to um, I, I I followed too many people, and I had to unfollow a lot of people because they weren't talking about stuff I like. They were getting into weirdo politics, and I did, I I like some politics, but not not for this. Um, that's a good way to be depressed. Do not talk about politics on Twitter. That's my advice. Talk about electronics and making and whatnot, uh, engineering. All right, so they're talking about how do you handle 20 amps on a PCB. And the guy, he had taken a PCB and uh, just used really thick uh, copper wire like you'd use in your house, like with no, no insulation on it. And he, he bent it. And, of course, his idea was he was going to have a CNC machine and where you could make kind of like a mold where you could cut a thing where you could bend into in case you wanted to make a bunch of them. So you bend these very specific pieces. And do, 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 do. so in order to hold the 20 amps, he... He, uh, I don't know if he had traces too, or if he was just, uh, it's kind of hard to tell by the, by the picture, but, um, that was a cool way to handle it. And so, you know, Dave Jones from the EEV blog, uh, chimed in, you know, of course I'm a fan, I follow him a lot. And, uh, he said, well, you could have just take, take regular wide traces and don't put any solder mask on them. So no green stuff. Uh, and then 
you'd have bare metal and then just cover that with solder and then you have this big thick strip of course other people chimed in and said that that the uh that the, the uh, solder would be higher resistance than copper but i started thinking about that and like i don't see that as being a problem uh, necessarily, because even if it's higher resistance, I think the way to view that uh, with a, a thin layer of copper, where's my hand? Thin layer of copper with a big thick wad of solder on top, that should be two resistors in parallel. You have the resistance of the copper, and we're, we're assuming DC here, so no inductance or capacitance to speak of. So at DC, uh, we, we should have, yeah, like I said, a resistor of copper and then a resistor of, of solder and even if one's higher than the other in parallel, that'll be still be smaller resistance than the original copper by itself. And also you have more surface area because, because the round nature of the solder. So thermal properties should improve, nothing else. So I don't know if it's perfect or not, but I'd like to do experiments on that. So if you guys are interested in that, let me know. That'd be kind of a fun one to talk about. If you have any ideas or experiments you want me to do, I love experiments, I love them. Okay, so yeah, so I had never thought about how to handle 20 amps on a PCB. I had a professor who, who uh, mistakenly he had told me he wanted three amps, and it turned out he wanted nothing even near that. And so I was like, three amps on a PCB? Well, how do you do that? And then if you check the calculators, three amps on just a standard trace is uh, not happening. So you've got to do some fancy stuff. But um, it does sound like the, the, the no-solder mask and use some solder on top of the, of the bare copper is the way to go. I found that interesting. I never even considered that, so that was kind of cool. Okay, and so last week's YouTube video, so far we've gotten zero plays on YouTube. So if we keep this up, by next week we'll still be at zero. <laughs> and I thought this would be the shocking one. I mean, I'm no good at these these titles. And it was just five features that the Arduino IDE is missing. And again, isn't that clickbaity? I have a number in the title. That should be good enough. You know what happened, don't you? Unfortunately, on the side of Twitter, I saw that... Uh, that uh, the Kardashian girl's getting divorced from the rapper guy. And uh, maybe that's what, what took it over. You know, normally I'd be getting all the traffic, I guess. But anyway, uh, five features that are missing from the Arduino IDE. I think the Arduino IDE is outstanding. I started with it. It pulled me in. It got me addicted. I guess you could say Arduino IDE is the Oxycontin. And microcontrollers are the heroin. Maybe. I don't know. You, you worked that out. Either way, I don't recommend either, just for the record, in case, there's, in case that's up for debate. Um, you know, the Arduino IDE is great for getting started, but then they, I, and I know they're trying to keep it simple. I get that. They're trying to make it perfect for, for beginners. And this is my argument. And I guarantee you that smarter people than me in some room have thought about this like, within the Arduino ecosystem. Like, what should we put in here? There are some things that make life simpler and easier. You just have to take nine seconds to learn them. And by saying we're going to keep the Arduino IDE simple, I guess I think they mean like streamlined, less stuff on the screen that will be easier for people. But it's I don't think that's the case. And let me give you just one example. I don't want to spoil my video and I don't remember what I put on it. But one was just having an outline. Um, and I use Platform IO for all my programming usually, unless I'm doing bare metal C stuff. And I'd like to use it for that too. We'll, we'll see. But I usually like to use the IDE of the microcontroller I'm using. Like, STM32, you know, has the STM32 Cube IDE, for example. But um, the outline feature, all it is, is you have a list of functions. Dun, 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 dun. So all your functions in your, your code, because the code can go, it can get really, really long. You know, if you have, I don't know, 10 or 20 pages of code. Now, with that said, it's better to use libraries, but then those spiral out of control and you have the same problem. But you have a bunch of functions in there. Well, it's really nice to say, okay, I'm looking for even just like the, the loop, the main loop in the Arduino code. Well, you go over the outline and you can sort it in alphabetical order and you just click on it and you go straight to it. And loop's not a great example because you can always just do the control F and search for loop. That's fine. But if um, I have something, I, I showed it in the video where I had some code where I had sine wave A, sine wave B, sine wave C, and sine wave D were all my functions. And then I was calling the, I, I, the nature of the code, I just call these functions like 40 something times. So if I'm looking for the one, and I can't remember the name of it, like exactly, and I can't remember if I use an underscore or whatever, then it's a real, it can take an extra 10 seconds to find a function. Now, if I'm doing something complicated, and I'm trying to remember a bunch of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, if my brain is maxed out, which when I'm programming, it pretty much is. I, I don't have anything else left to give. 
And then it's like, I don't want to have to be remember, remembering stuff and searching. Like it, it's, it's stressful in a way. Um, I think it, it's the kind of thing that wears a person out. But if you can just jump straight to it instantly, well, that's awesome. So um, the outline feature is, is in many IDEs. I know the Eclipse has it. Um, and so therefore, mo any of the, the Eclipse derived uh, uh, code will too, or uh, IDEs will too. But I just don't know why Arduino wouldn't put that in there. Because I, I, you look at a, a outline, even if you're brand new to microcontrollers, even if you're intimidated by all the new lingo, the you know, spy this, mosey that. Uh, it even if you're intimidated, well, an outline's not going to mess you up. You're not, you're not going. It's not going to be any worse. So at least you can find your stuff quicker. I, I would think that'd be a relief. So anyway, I think that's something that Arduino should consider, and that's just one. And I all of my examples were like that. Um, the, the debugger might have been a hair more complicated, but also has a lot more benefit. So anyway, I check that out. The video, check out that video. You can. Uh, yeah, it's called the five features the Arduino IDE is missing. I thought it was a good uh, argument, but uh, we'll see what happens with the old YouTube verse. And this week, it looks like I'm going to try to make a real human video with my camera, and not this stupid webcam this time, which is what I usually do. Um, and the, the working title is, is "Can you solder reflow on your?" Or re, I said that wrong. Can you reflow solder on your kitchen stove? For anybody that's done um, SMT assembly, which means you put use a little service discrete service mount parts on your on your board, tiny little parts. Um, soldering them is kind of a pain, and it's it's just easier if you can use a, a solder paste stencil and just wipe it on one time, toss on your parts, and then just heat the thing up. Now, some people use ovens, and that's fine, uh, but I've played around with ovens, and I had parts that would slide and, and go and do the wrong thing, go where I didn't want them to go. People always talk about the surface tension that will always yank the part into the perfect spot. That's true most of the time. There are exceptions to this, and that's if you have a little bit too much goo on there, and sometimes a little goo goes a long way. Uh, if you have a, a, too much goo and you're using a really light part, in my case, uh, 0805 LEDs, so really small LEDs have no mass to them to speak of. They almost float away. And so when you put goo, even if you put the tiniest amount of goo you can, there's this tendency, they like to shift, uh, not dead center, but actually off, or they attract each other, almost like two magnets pulling, like two LEDs, they're too close together. And for what I was doing with this little matrix type thing, it, it was a factor. So um, I tried using the solder paste and it still really didn't help. Like, I mean, or I shouldn't say, I, sh I tried using the solder paste stencil, sorry. And I still had a little bit too much goo on there. I don't really know how, how to, how to, proceed from there but anyway so it's nice to use to have use some kind of a hot plate like you can a lot of people recommend the kitchen hot plates you can get walmart for like 35 bucks but uh you heat from the bottom heat propagates up and uh, then you have access to the top so you can use tweezers to to adjust parts that get weird it does happen and maybe you know you can use an oven and then just use the the, the what you would call it, the heat gun to to adjust the parts as needed but this just seemed like a better way, just to get it right, right from the beginning, um, from the source, you could say. And so anyway, um, I did that, but I wanted to see if you could do it on a stove, and and it turned out I would say a complete success, 100% success. I have, I see no downsides to just using the stove. I don't need to buy a hot plate, but I could see where people would would disagree. And I want to make it clear, and this is something I'm going to put in the video. You could only really pull this off if the wife is gone. If the wife is out shopping, just do it. She will never know. There's no evidence. And, I mean, there's again, there's no downsides. There's no health issues that I'm aware of. No worse than using a hot plate or anything else. But, uh, you know, you, you go at your own risk. God knows whatever I did wrong. But um, the big secret was I just used a little piece of aluminum, like a 7-inch like a by 7-inch square. And I put my circuit board on top of that. So that went fine for me. Um, you know, your mileage may vary, but uh, we'll make the video and uh, well, I'll make the video and hopefully uh, people get something out of it and, you know, whatever. That's not for everybody, but okay. I'm going to give me a drink of water. And now let's go to the big, the big dog topic here. Does Arduino programming have any place in the professional environment? Now the title will probably say, will omit the programming part, but uh, I hear a lot of people say, oh, you can't put Arduino on a product, and they all, always default to the Arduino Uno. Now, the Arduino Uno certainly could be put in a product. I have one. My CNC machine uses Arduino Uno with a shield on top, with a little GR Gerbil, I'm just going to say Gerbil, G-R-B-L, uh, Gerbil shield on top to control my, my stepper motors. 
Um, so it can be done, and it's not a terrible way to go. Um, but it, it uses up a lot of space. It's, it's not the most efficient. But uh, well, I say it's it's uh, it might be the most time efficient if it does the job right off the bat for you. So yeah, I don't want to I guess discredit that. Efficient's the wrong wrong approach. It uses up quite a bit of space. You could achieve the same thing on a, on just a single PCB if you laid out a board and use your own microcontroller, for example. Um, you could achieve that exact same thing on a much smaller form factor. That's an issue for cell phone makers and not so much CNC people. But uh, I I don't think we have to be limited to Arduino Uno hardware anymore. And if you've looked at the microcontrollers that you can program with the Arduino IDE just by you know adding those little uh, additional libraries or whatever you call them, it's staggering. You know, you have all the STM32 stuff, which that alone's a billion microcontrollers. You've got uh, the, the ESP32s. Obviously, a lot of people do all kinds of cool video type stuff with those, uh, among other things, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. There are so many options out there, in addition to AVR and Atmel and all that, uh, that we don't have to think in those terms. Now, even if you're used to using Arduino Uno, the actual microcontroller is an 18 mega 328p. Not a bad little microcontroller in its own right for being AVR. It's, compared to other stuff, it's not as awesome. But it, if you're just blinking lights or doing some basic stuff, it's it's overkill most of the time. So we don't have to be limited to those, but uh, we can just use the microcontroller itself uh, in our boards, in our PCBs, if we want to. But we can still use the Arduino programming. And so um, I guess to sum it up really quickly, and, and we'll kind of circle back around maybe, is... When should you use bare metal C, like straight up embedded C, and when should you use the Arduino programming language? And in general, my answer is I use C when it's cheaper. And I use Arduino programming when it's cheaper. And I don't just mean price, I mean time and, and, and also uh, factoring in the price of the microcontrollers. And I think I made this mistake I mean, a year or two ago when I was really thinking about this a lot. I'm kind of stressing out about it. I thought, well, I just need to use the, the, the real deal embedded C stuff because that's what everybody else does and it's so much more efficient in terms of CPU cycles. And it may be cheap on CPU cycles, but it might take an extra month to, to do the coding for C. And whereas Arduino might be a library, you put, throw in three lines of code, you might be done. Maybe not, but it just depends on your, on your situation. But in those cases, it really comes down to the quantity you intend to sell. And so this is where the bit where the rubber hits the road. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of the solution to the, cur the current climate. Because see, when I went back to school in 2016, my original thought was, I'm going to get awesome electronics at school, which didn't happen, by the way. That's not what engineering is. I'm going to get awesome electronics at school, and I'm going to have my own products ready to go, and I'm going to sell them. Well, when I started, you know, on whatever, Tendi, eBay, Amazon, etc. And that's still part of the plan to a certain degree. But... I started real hearing all these horror stories of, of people that would come up with a product and then even before their product was was ready to be released, the clone was already out. And you ask, well, how's that possible? Well, that's possible because whenever you, you send your files off to China to have them manufactured, it's legal for them to, quote unquote, borrow your design. Now, Bunny, uh, in his uh, book, The Hardware Hacker, he talks about there are cultural differences between China and America. We think we, Americans think we own an idea, and that's part of this patent thing. And in China, they are much more apt to share the idea right away. And um, I'm not going to get into the anthropological issues there, but if you're used to the American frame of reference and say, oh, we design, we put, you know, a million dollars or whatever, six months of our time into designing a thing, we think we have the right to sell that thing. Well, in China, I, from what I hear, it's a little bit different, and even their laws allow them to do this often. Where so you send the get off the the Gerbers to get the circuit boards manufactured, and before you know it, the whole product, including you know whatever, like the cooler or whatever it is you're making, uh, ends up you know being for sale on AliExpress or whatever before yours is even out, because they're faster at manufacturing and more efficient at it than you are, more or less. So. Um, there are people that are better at manufacturing than, than us, uh, especially like me. I haven't manufactured really anything unless you count, you know, a few PCBs for a few bucks, you know, JLC PCB. That's about it. So um, people that are better at it can easily copy your stuff. And so I was really kind of frustrated when I really I saw that, oh, man, the Chinese cloning thing is a real problem. 
uh, they, they'll take a $10 thing I can make and maybe even make a living off of, and, and they'll just sell it for, for 99 cents, and then I'm done for. How do I make a living? How do I feed my family like this? And uh, what am I going to do? And so it was stressful for a few years. But then I uh, got me an internship at a local place here. It was called EVTV. So you get electric vehicle television was the thing. Unfortunately, the owner, the you know, the, the brains behind most operation, uh, he died last year. But uh, EVTV.me is worth looking at. And they designed uh, power inverters. They took batteries from Tesla cars and made it where you could power your RV in case you want uh, solar, via solar or whatnot. So it was a pretty cool company. <clears throat> but their big trick with them was they were low volume. And of course, if they're low volume, that means high markup. That's just the way it works. And not, not really a slam on them, but you know, at least you know, a part that maybe I could make for 10 bucks. Well, maybe, maybe that sells for 100 in this case. It's not, not doesn't have the Amazon pressure on it because they're doing low volume. People paid it because it was worth it to them. But when I, I saw the high volume, or sorry, the low volume, high markup approach, I was like, oh, so if you sell a synthesizer for $2,000, let's just say some really high end music synthesizer, when you can normally buy, I don't know, buy a medium one for three hundred dollars, we'll say, if you can make a thousand or two thousand dollar one, well, suddenly your quantities certainly go down. But if it, your synthesizer is truly worth it, cloning it is this not worth it to to the uh, to the cloning type people uh, because there's just not enough quantity there. It doesn't matter if they can make it for eighty three dollars; it's just not worth it. They're only going to sell seven of them. So if you sell for two thousand at seven, well, suddenly maybe you, you're getting somewhere. So uh, anyhow, I really learned that the, the solution to, to my problems with products is, is just to go for, I wouldn't say make them expensive on purpose, but make them freaking good where they really solve a problem, a big problem for somebody. And so suddenly if we're doing low volume and that's kind of, I'm, this is taking me a long way to get here. I'm sorry. But if you're doing low volume, if you're only going to sell 150 of your thing this year and you're content with that, well, there is no benefit to making the microcontroller 87 cents cheaper. Now, if you're selling a billion of something, and if you can take six months, let's just say $50,000 on an engineer's, you know, senior engineering salary or whatever, uh, it may be worth it to knock those few pennies off the price. But knocking pennies off the price when the markup is quite a bit higher, it's just not worth it. And so therefore, using C is not always worth it. Using C is only really cheaper when, I guess if you know what better than Arduino, no one does that. So using C is only cheaper when you're talking high quantities. So suddenly, uh, I had two solutions to my my problem of how am I going to make a living making my own my own boards, making my own products. And it, the it solved three things. It solved the Chinese uh, cloning problem. They're not going to clone um, low volume stuff. You fly under their radar. Um, you uh, hang on. I, I had <laughs> lost my train of thought there. Uh, you avoid the cloning thing. You can still make a living and you can program quicker. And that's where Arduino comes in. So we have these Arduino libraries that, you know, many, many people that are vastly more you know, skilled programmers than I have put together. It's kind of dumb not to use an Arduino library and if it's there and you're in a hurry. I mean, if you want to just learn, then and I've certainly done that. I've made my own libraries just to say I did. But um, if you need to get a product out, well, Arduino is where it's at. So what downsides are there to, to using Arduino? We know the performance is slower. Well, how much slower is it? And th these are the, I don't, I, can't, I don't have a great number for you, but uh, in a video a couple weeks back where I wanted to see how fast I could get a, a STM32 blue pill to toggle a, a pin off and on, I, I, what did I get? Was it 13 megahertz? Eh, eh, I hate to say. It, but it was, it was well, let's just go ahead and go 12 megahertz. I could be wrong on this. Over 10 megahertz uh, for just toggling. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, uh, in real life, and I, I was using some of the optimizations, the fast digital write option, which uh, is a library available for most things. Uh, STM32 Duino, uh, the, the framework that uses Arduino for the STM32 comes with that built in. But using the fast rewrite and just doing a few basic optimizations, which I talked about, you know, I guess previously, yeah, last week probably, um, I was able to uh, say toggle that, that pin really quickly but uh, in real life, well, what, what do I um, what do I do? Well, my, with my synth, here was something I was worried about. I need something called polyphony. Pol polyphony. So when you hit nine keys at once, I want nine notes to play instantly, and that's not necessarily hard. MIDI uh, sends uh, I don't know, it's like six or seven bytes 
every time you had to push a note, basically. So we had to deal with six or seven notes. We'll just say seven times nine. So we had 63 bytes coming in instantly, which again, now that I think about it, it doesn't sound like it's that hard. I think this is stuff they were doing in like 1982. But regardless, I was worried that Arduino would slow it down too much. I've, I've heard the horror stories. Um, and of course, in addition to hitting those notes, it's got to you know hit the spy bus with, uh, hmm, let's just say 10 bytes per note. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. So basically, we got about 200 bytes to deal with in instantly. And uh, I thought maybe there'd be a slight delay and that that last one would lag. And no, so far, I've had no issues with speed. So just using a little $2, of course, I say that, to, to buy the microcontroller on DigiKey is $5. So using a $5 microcontroller and our Duano programming, I've had no issues with that. Now, again, I realize that's a terrible example, but it's also a real-time example. And I think real-time puts a different kind of pressure on you than, than uh, I don't know, some other, some pre- when you have to react instantly to real life, that, that's something that, you know, suddenly the pressure's on, I guess. And um, so anyway, I I don't see any downsides to the Arduino programming uh, if, as long as I can spend a few extra bucks to get the microcontroller that I absolutely need. And of course, we know the bomb, build of materials. Some people say two times bomb, three times bomb is what you should charge. So if your product costs $100, you should charge maybe $200 or $300 for it. So if you add an extra dollar to your microcontroller, you're going to add 2 or $3 to the price of your product. There will be a point where you run out and your, your, bomb, your cost of your product will exceed uh, the, what the market will pay. So for sure, when you're designing a product, you definitely want to keep that, those things to a minimum. And that's where that, that pressure to, to use embedded C comes in once again. But at what point does a product succeed or fail based on just that, those two or three dollars on the microcontroller. In other words, if you can get by on a, a 87 cent uh, AVR or whatnot, when does does that succeed? But a three dollar uh, STM product, STM32, will say uh, uh, it's too expensive, like for people to buy it, and that would only happen on very small products. So if you're if you got a hundred dollar, if you're going to sell your product for a hundred dollars. And you go, uh oh, we got to make this upgrade. Now it's one hundred and three dollars. That's not a deal breaker most of the time. Um, now, if you're charging four dollars for a product and you got to go up to seven, well, you've almost doubled your your, your fee there. So, um, anyway, I guess I, I kind of rambled a lot. I didn't really put much thought into this. I just thought I'd freestyle it. So you guys, I, I applaud you for hanging in there. Um, so that's my take on it. I like Arduino. I guess is what I'm saying, and I'm not ready to. Uh, to go embedded C unless I have a damn good reason to. And just for the record, embedded C is fun too, but it, man, you spend a lot. <laughs> You'll spend a month on something that takes 10 minutes in Arduino. Just, just be fair warned that happens. Be ready to deal with that. Okay, so this was the Electron In Injection Podcast. I'm Brandon Drury. You can follow me on Twitter, Brandon underscore Drury. I am actually checking that. I do actually like Twitter now, which is weird. Oh man, but what a... You have to hit the unfollow button a lot, but it can be a good place. Um, of course, yeah, you follow me on YouTube. I have a video every week. I'm, I'm wanting to get those to be, I don't know, better is the right word. More, I don't know. I'm, I'm working on the YouTube channel's work in progress, but we're getting somewhere. Let's just say that. Um, if you got any questions, you can always yell at me. I'm on all the, the things, the Facebooks and the, the, the Twitter and the, the Instagram and all that crap. So, um, Go to electroninjection.com. I have a whole list of all my social media stuff. All right, guys, over and out.